Welcome back for episode two of the Positive Impact Podcast. My name is Rob Johnson, and we're in the heart of the Bear Factory here in Whitmore Lake, Michigan. Joining me again for their own show, Jerry McLean, Jimmy Banish. Welcome, gentlemen. Pleasure. Glad to be back. Excellent. So we are on round two. And the first episode, if listeners missed out, they absolutely need to go back and listen to the origin story of the Bear Factory. A lot of excellent stories in there with, uh, you know, Jerry bootlegging cash back from Florida and <laughs> hiding in different compartments. <laughs> One of the highlights, I think, of the episode for me. But today I want to talk about the logistics of the Bear Factory, how it works, how you serve customers, product lines. So, Jimmy, for this episode, I want to start with you. So I think probably the most common question you might get is, this is a retail shop. And do you guys do B2C? So do you serve consumers? So walk me through the logistics of the company and who your actual target market for service is. Yeah, we are strictly uh, B2B or business to business. So, you know, approaching it from a wholesale perspective where we, you know, infuse and supply the retail segment. Like we don't do any, uh, we don't work with mom is what I tell customers, you know. We solely focus on supporting, you know, business brands and um, providing, you know, merchandising uh, for those locations. And that can vary from anything from, um, you know, private event companies to, um, you know, amusement parks, theme parks, water parks, uh, all the way down to we have a, a very robust, bustling um, mobile community that you know, I call them my guerrilla warfare against other, you know, really large, more corporate plush companies where they're confined to four walls and a roof in the brick and mortar traditional retail model. Our mobile, you know, customer base, they can take our stuffing machines and go to schools, to homes, um, to on-site locations for all the same type of create your own plush experience. So that's kind of a you know, what we really focus on and, you know, making sure that we're great at what we do is important. You know, we know how to stay in our lane and, you know, only focusing on offering, you know, plush from our 16 and 8 inch sizes. You know, we have our whole clothing line for both 16 and 8 inch. You know, we built, hand build stuffing machines locally here in Brighton as well. Um, and now we're even moving into um, building out trailers for customers too, um, whether they're doing it at a mobile level or just moving it around on property because they need, um, you know, they have seasonality for what their plush programs are and, you know, having just a, a dedicated building doesn't always fit uh, for some of these larger properties so they can just move the trailer around and it's a mobile store on wheels. Absolutely. So, so Jerry, going over to you, you guys are nearing 25 years in the industry. How has that process evolved over that time? At the beginning, it used to be only the big customer. Let's call it a big theme park, a big A or a B inline store at a major mall. That seemed to be the direction of the industry. Now we look at the malls have changed. Um, you see very, very little of this product in the malls anymore. You'll see it more out into the general public. One of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did was every one of the competitors that we deal with sell retail to the customer. We wanted to make sure that we're not a retail company at all. We wanted to make sure that we're only going to support the business because they're doing the hardest work and that's getting the sale, the end sale. So we really made sure that we were supporting them. And in, in with that whole division of coming away from, you know, the theme park, the inline store, we really had to get down and dirty. And, and what we mean by that is, how are we going to now come up with a new customer base? Because if you're only at a retail location, you're very limited as to how many people you can reach because those people have to come to your door or through your gate to be able to generate a sale. Our philosophy was let's support the person that's willing to go somewhere and be at another location in a different location in a different location. And so that's what's opened up our door to major ex expansion in our company, especially since Jimmy's come on board. Jimmy has really 
you know, taken it to a whole new direction. And, and the company is flourishing because of it. So right now, what are the ideal types of people that are approaching you to get support from you guys from a wholesale perspective? You know, I think um, working with, you know, we have our more corporate type customers where they have, you know, eight plus locations or properties. Like we work a lot with like management companies that, you know, they don't necessarily own the attraction. They do the retail management for it. You know, those are always really great opportunities because those are um, extremely high volume properties. And what we really like to focus on, you know, this is an experience. If you, stuffed plush and unstuffed plush are two totally different, you know, segments. Yeah, they're in the plush category, but grabbing off the shelf a grab and go plushy is a totally different experience than, you know, hand picking out something um, that's unstuffed, going and uh, interfacing with the stuffing machine and building that, you know, with your, with a, a child. And then you can, ex, you know, do accessories with clothing or whatever it is. Like it's, you know, it's not just a quick, you know, 30 second off the shelf transaction. You know, there's memories and emotion that's being elicited through Well, that. the child's probably more invested because now they're seeing, you know, the, the plushie come to life in a sense. Yes, right? yep, they have part in creating and building it and, you know, putting, um, a little star inside of it, or we have recording modules. What's really popular is we have uh, ultrasound customers who will record a baby's heartbeat, and they'll put that inside of it, and they'll do a gender reveal party or something of the sort. And you know, I have a um, bear at home with Araya's heartbeat. You know, when we went to our first ultrasound. So, you know, there's lots of it, it's just a different experience, and that's what we're all about. But um, having those corporate customers is great. You know, they're high volume, but at the same time, you know, 80% of our line is made from 100% recycled fabrics. So there's an, there's an educational moment there to be able to teach kids the importance of, you know, land stewardship and animal conservation, and that's something we're really focused on. Um, so there's, you know, the corporate customer. But then you also have the mom and pop small business you know, similar to us, you know, we're, we're still family owned and operated, you know, we're just at scale, but working with those small businesses that makes up about, you know, our mobile community makes up about 20% of our revenue. Our small business owners makes up about, you know, 45, 50, the yeah. 50% of our revenue right now, where in, you know, a lot of businesses, their top 10 customers make up, you know, probably 80% 80%. of their revenue. Ours, over the last five years, because of our efforts and education and working with customers, it's really started to spread out, which helps us in moments of, um, you know, economic downturn, like in 2020, when everything just went to a standstill. You know, we were supposed to be in lockdown. Key and I were sneaking in here. We were working two, three days a week because there's no way a small business can totally just shut down. Right. You know, I don't know who was buying plushies during lockdown, but people were, yeah. and, you know, FedEx was running, so we were running. And, you know, her, we were coming in here, but it's um, the variety of customers that we have in the variety of, of industries and segments we touch on. We're always busy. You know, I think it makes us more resilient to, you know, those type of economic downturns, and um, it's the it's a really great opportunity to, for us to meet a lot of different people in a lot of different you know, spaces as well. We're starting to see a lot of people that are looking at close to retirement or maybe an early retirement and they're looking for something to do. And like our, our event you know, uh, side of our business where you know, they buy a trailer and they go to these different events and you're starting to see the, the entrepreneurial spirit of people that have been in corporate or a teacher or something like that for the past 30 years, and now all of a sudden they want to do something different. You know, and, and so the difference between our plush and, say, the, the normal plush that you would get, this is what you would get if you ordered something from a normal plush company. A, a already stuffed animal, it's already done, filled, there's nothing to do other than buy it 
and you're done. The difference is our plush is completely different. The head is stuffed already just to keep, you know, the expression of the animal and the face and the eyes, but ours are unstuffed. And so this is the experience that Jimmy was talking about earlier of bringing this animal to life. And so it's a completely unique experience compared to just buying it off the shelf. Yes, they may love these just as much, but they remember these more because they brought it to life. Yeah. Well, you're attaching an experience to the animal. It's not just so transactional. There's yes. some, there's some relatable moments there as well, which I think is quite important. Now, as time has pressed on and, and you guys have diversified product lines, one of the hallmarks of any good brand is quality control, right? You had mentioned in the first episode, Jerry, that if you don't have you know, the proper product and, and quality, people aren't gonna keep coming back. And one of the biggest selling points when you guys first started was people picking up an animal and turning it over and saying, oh, where did this come from? And they see, oh, the bear factory, right? Yes. And then they call and you know, you know, place an order. How does quality control work with an operation at this scale? Where does it start, where does it end, and how do you guys facilitate the it? The first thing you have to do is you have to design the animal. Uh, so you'll, you'll start out with maybe a picture of something or an idea of something. And then you go through, what do you like about it? What do you dislike about it? What size do we want to go with? You know, How much money do you want to spend with that particular item? Jimmy took that over. That was pretty much everything that I used to do was you know, put together the animals, and now he's taken that over 100%, which is great for me. But the, the, the important thing is, is it can go 8, 10, 12 different vi revisions until you get to that final stage. Once you get to the final stage of a R&D product, now that's your prototype, and that is what we keep. Those are one-offs, and those are what the manufacturing is based off of. So when you do it over in China, when you manufacture in China, you have to remember that you have to have good QC, which is quality control on the ground, really, really watching out for your benefit. Because sometimes the factory is not going to watch out for your benefit. They just want to move product through, get paid. Remember, we, we, we have to pay 100% for all of our product before it leaves China or it doesn't leave China. So we have to then trust in that whole customer quality standard before we can even see the product. And as you mentioned in the first episode, that's a, sometimes a three to six month turnaround if there are mistakes that are made. So it can be very costly and timely. It used to be um, years ago, probably 15 years ago, you used to be able to get the fabric, which is this part of the animal, you used to be able to get that in about a week to 12 days from the um, fabric mills in China. That now is a four to a six week time period. So it's really changed um, just because the, the quality and the amount that the Chinese government allows a factory to manufacture over there now is under strict guidelines. So it's a much, elongated time period so if you call it four to six weeks then they have to go into the cut and sew and the cut and sew are literally a football field long of a table probably double this size and there's these laser cutters that they'll roll these big bolts of fabric all the way down they're a hundred yards in length and then they literally stretch them and then these laser cutters cut out every piece of the product, whether it's the ears or the feet or the, the body, the legs, and then it's all sewn from there. So you really have to have a quality control factor at the factory level. And we have, you know, we even take it a step further. We have, you know, various, um, all of our supply chain has to abide by and, and have yearly certifications. So we have like ISO 9001 quality control certifications. We have ISO uh, 14001 environmental management, you know, certifications. So there's a lot of different, you know, certifications that we make sure that, you know, both the operation has, but then even down to the product, um, you know, you have EN71 certifications, which is European safety standard. You have ASTM F963, which is U.S. custom safety standard certification that all of our animals have. Um, but even materials-wise, you know, as far as our 
animals that are made from the recycled fabrics. You know, that's Global Recycle Standard 100 or GRS 100 certified. All, all of the animals, as Jerry showed with the husky, the head has pre-filling. All of our animals have um, recycled polyfill pre-filling on the inside, and that's actually pretty standard in the plush industry now. You'll see tags where it's, um, it'll say Eco Plush, and then you look closer and it says, um, you know, some parts made from sustainable material, and it's like, okay, well, filling it with recycle polyfill yeah. is really not that difficult so it's really more of a marketing thing yeah. but not many companies very few are actually doing recycled fabrics and it all comes down to cost yeah a lot of these larger companies you know they could be public or um you know they have shareholders that they have to you know show their numbers to and um they're just about do uh, bottom line it, it comes down to cost and volume well he volume, came to volume. me and he says well i want to go to the recycled business and uh, the green movement and i looked at him and i go no it's just <laughs> it's just not going to work the customer isn't going to want to pay more for it and he, he fought me and he kept on coming back and i said no it's just not I, I don't see that direction i have to admit i was wrong i said okay you can have three different SKUs, which would be three different items that you can go ahead and introduce this and let's see what happens. We introduced a shark, a great white shark, um, a seaweed the sea turtle, um, and then ocean the octopus. And uh, we put in a production, it takes six to eight months. It lands June of 2020. So like we're literally coming out of lockdown. And the biggest thing is at the time the the cost per unit was around 50 cents more to do the recycled fabric than the traditional version polyester and we had to price this competitively so we only did a 25 cent increase per unit took a 25 cent hit which really is our bottom line yeah. um, you know and, and still even to this day the virgin poly uh, product it's it's 25 cents less than the recycled and it's because it's really about the responsibility of the product and the sustainability and, and the message behind it you know we make less on the recycled but you know we can feel we feel really good about it and it's actually a, a far superior fabric than even the traditional virgin polyester it's it's thicker it's denser um so qual you know saying you want to go green and having something that has a better uh, footprint that's one thing but elevating the product with that mindset is a totally different obstacle and, and they sell better yeah. yeah i have to admit it they sell better so so why did you select those three animals to roll out first yeah so we rolled out it's called you know i came up with plush for the planet and my whole philosophy was we were taking plastic out of the ocean and making ocean animals with it. So that was like the whole mentality. And then I even threw in um, like Ocean the Octopus. I didn't market this well and I got bashed for it, but Ocean the Octopus only had six legs. And I did that for the original six because the Detroit Red Wings being in Michigan, I did six legs for the original six and I was getting bashed by customers because like octopus have eight legs. And I'm like, no, it well, has not to these be ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the current ocean has eight legs, but the first like two years, we all, he only had six legs because of the original six, but people, I guess, use it for more educational purposes than I intended. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Mom, I thought you said, hey, <laughs> yeah. this one's got six, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so safety is a subcategory of quality control, of course. Uh, what safety concerns do you have to be vigilant of as you're producing these animals? Because obviously they're going to kids, right? Kids put things in their mouth, they, you know, they, they treat things very differently than adults. So what safety concerns do you need to be aware of as you're producing uh, toys like this? I'll give you a good story. When, after about five years in the industry, I really wanted to come up with an innovative new way. And that was we would bring in some of our animals just like we, we had here, but other ones we would bring them in without the eyes in them. And so children would be able to then pick off of a board what color eyes, what style. And there was even a circle that would go behind the eye that would say, I love you or whatever, 
you know, different sayings, best friends. And we introduced that on a global basis. It went well, but we found out that safety, if the person putting the eye in and stamping the eye in and pressing it in didn't do it correctly, all of a sudden there's a liability issue. So we didn't have any issues, but you don't want to stare down the gun of, of a liability issue. So even though it went well, it meant double the inventory. So we had to carry the same item two different ways for customers that wanted it this way or without the eyes. We did that and then we finally broomed that particular thing just because of the viability of safety. I remember we ended up stamping when I was in high school. Yeah. We like converted some of the uh, the no eye stock and um, it, it could get tricky, like depending yeah. on the material if you didn't get it perfect. But we ended up, I'm, that's one job that I remember was sitting there, it was the worst. Yeah. Just stamping hundreds of plushes' eyes. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so as we sit here today and, and we're you know talking about quality control and you know, the product diversity, how do you select new products today? And how many new products do you roll out per year on average? I um, I'll circulate. You know we we run about a hundred SKUs for our sixteen inch, about fifty for our eight inch. Um, we're looking to expand that once we move into our new facility here in like the next year or two. Um, but we have always been about always making sure what we do carry are best sellers and they sell well and running deeper in inventory because um, a lot of our customers are event based or they're, you know, uh, they have seasons and they might be running through particular items that are really hot that yeah. particular season. And then we run out of stock and for 30 days and that can really hit, you know, their numbers. Um, so we really like to run deeper in inventory on what we have. We don't have the most SKUs, but a, a great quote that I like to, that I like to tell people that I received from, um, a customer of ours, a long-term customer, he said, you know, there's other plush companies out there who have like the flashy, cool, kitschy stuff that might be popular for 12 months or so. He goes, they're the sizzle, but you're the steak. Like, we know that we can count on you guys. We know that that quality is there. And, you know, Bear, Bear Factory is going to have it if we need it. Um, but, you know, circulating, you know, 10 to 15 percent of the uh, of the line out every year. Um, and that's really based on sales. You know, we look at the sales and then we'll look for trends. You know, we have um, a pretty successful fundraising, you know, division of operators that have been uh, going into schools and, they, they came, one of the operators came to us, um, Doug Bishop, who uh, came up with this great fundraising program, Buddyathon. He said, uh, do you know what an axolotl is? And I'm like, no, what's that? And he goes, all these kids are telling me that axolotl, they, I need axolotls because that's what they have in Minecraft. And I go, well, I don't play Minecraft. Like, <laughs> I have no idea what an axolotl is. So I started to look into it, and it's actually really cool. Like, axolotls are... You know, we have one down over there, but... Um, Here, I'll grab it while you're talking. Yeah, you know, they, they have, they're in, uh, native to, like, where Mexico City now, now is, and um, that's where they're indigenous to. And they actually, um, because of development, it's, it's a great story, um, because of development and, you know, just what we have done as, you know, human beings, um, we this would be extinct like axolotls would be extinct if they weren't popular as household pets and they're like extremely expensive too but what's really unique about them is that they have the, the ability to regenerate limbs and scientists have even like put ears on them and some of them glow like at night and they're just like a really unique resilient animal that is now made popular through just you know culture a cultural thing you know with with video games but um hearing stories about what kids find to be popular from the field like we talked about before you know always talking to our customers having our ear down to the ground and finding out what's popular that's a big driving factor of how we introduce items yeah. and we'll do um, an annual report card every year to our customers, hey, how are we doing? What would you like to see? You know, what are some plush items you'd like to see? What are some clothing? And we take those into consideration as well. But um, very rarely, you know, maybe 
of those 15 items, five of them are my ideas. The other 10 are from customers. Okay, very good. Very good. Jerry, do you have a particular favorite plush that you've... No, I like the best one that sells the most. My man, that's a business, <laughs> that's a business guy right there. Yeah. So I like. So as we look to close, I'm going to take this one from you, Jimmy. I'm going to hand this one over to you. So last week we closed on looking at you know plush with a purpose. One of the really unique things about your business that I quite like is every single animal that you bring out has some type of meaning or purpose or homage to a historical figure or a personal tie. I really like that. I like closing the episode on that. So who do we have today? Yeah, so here we have um, Serengeti, the uh, wild dog, um, obviously based out of Africa. But I was watching, um, I think it was like Our Planet or one of the David Attenborough documentaries with my daughter, Araya, and they had a whole family of these on there. And um, this every year we have various environmental projects as a company that we focus on. And uh, this year, for 2024 and 2025, our focus is um, called Reduce Your Carbon Paw Print. So we're looking at our carbon footprint, um, both from a product perspective, but then also as an operational perspective and a theme for this particular episode where they're touching on, you know, Serengeti's family was, you know, the just the environmental impact that we're having on these particular areas throughout the world and they're kind of touching on you know droughts and things like that that are really impacting um, African wild dogs so I just thought that this would just be another great opportunity you know this is made from the recycled fabrics but just another little backstory and item and I also really love uh, the, the material and the detail that the wild dogs have you know from you know the ears to the eyes to the nose but it's just like a really cool different fabric and different looking animal that i thought kids would really resonate with and have fun with you know one thing that sticks out to me if we cut to the wide shot people are watching on youtube is you see all these animals in the background the detail the level of detail in each one is astonishing like it's not typically what you're going to see in the, when you mentioned just pick something off a shelf and, and do that, the every single thing is very carefully curated. It's very, very nice how you guys will put all this together. Yeah, it all has to do with the face, like, you know, kids and just, I think people in general just really resonate with what they see in the eyes and, you know, what the they're expression. seeing back. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, we spend a lot of time on the face structure Jerry yeah, talks about. Yeah, right here. This is, this is what we focus on. We did a, a study back many years ago, and we brought a bunch of kids, local kids. What, what, why do you, why do you pick that animal? What, you know, what was your reason? And 90% of the time, it was the face and the eyes. So we made a decision based on those kids. Rather than our decision as adults, we wanted to know why they did, why they wanted it that way. Well, they wanted it that way. They liked the expression. They liked the, you know, the, the style of the eye or the style of the nose, whatever it may be. And we've made a decision that we're going to bring our animals in with a stuffed head, which meant that when the child picks the animal out, they get to pick out an animal based on whatever they're seeing. And it's already done. It's already stuffed. Because many of the people in our industry, they don't have stuffed heads. So they're seeing something coming in just like oh, this, and it doesn't have any, <laughs> any expression at all to it. But that's that a point. sad polar bear, Grandpa. I don't know if I want it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your time. I certainly appreciate it. I'm looking forward to our next episode. Uh, so listeners, if you want to know more about the Bear Factory, you can find out more about them in the show notes. Until then, we'll catch you on the next episode. Take care.